Okay, this video is going to be an introduction to basically this entire chapter. We're going to be looking at alpha carbon chemistry, and that involves the reactions of enols and enolates. And so let's talk about what those are. So the reactions of this chapter are going to involve carbonyl compounds. And when we talk about the proximity of other carbons to the carbon of the carbonyl group, we use Greek letters to describe them. So the carbon of the carbonyl group itself doesn't get a letter. The first carbon away is called the alpha carbon, then the one that's two away is the beta, and then three away is the gamma. And so we're primarily going to be interested in reactions involving the protons, or the hydrogens, that are attached to the alpha carbons. All right, so it turns out if we have a ketone and it's in the presence of an acid or a base, the ketone will exist in equilibrium with its enol. And the enol gets its name because we have an alkene, ene, directly adjacent to an alcohol, all. So put those together, we get an ene, all. Now we first encountered the relationship between ketones and aldehydes and their uh, enol counterparts back last semester. So when we were looking at reactions of alkynes, when we did hydration or hydroboration oxidation of an alkyne, we added an H and an OH to that alkyne. And so uh, we added an OH that converted the triple bond into a double bond. And so we made enols. But as we talked about, these very quickly isomerize into the ketone or the aldehyde. And this process of converting back and forth between the ketone and the enol, it's an isomerization, uh, but it has a special name, and this is called tautomerization, and so we would say the ketone and the enol are tautomers of one another. Now we have to be careful. One common mistake is to think of the keto and enol tautomers uh, as being different resonance structures, but they're not, right? To be two different resonance structures, all we can move around is the electrons. Right? And what's happening in this isomerization right, is we're actually moving this hydrogen. The hydrogen is moving from the alpha position to becoming uh, a hydrogen on the alcohol. And so this is not a resonance, it is an isomerization. Now, most of the time, the ketone or aldehyde form is the more stable. And so even though they're in equilibrium and we have some of them uh, that are both present, both the keto and the enol, it's generally the ketone that is in uh, much higher concentrations. There are some exceptions. So this is one example of that exception. And so uh, we have only about 10 to 30 percent that exists in the diketone form, and 70 to 90 percent exists in the enol form. And so there are two factors that give rise to the special stability of the enol in this case. So perhaps the easiest to see is we have int intramolecular hydrogen bonding between the alcohol and the ketone. And so this is a stabilizing force. In addition, in the diketone form, we don't have any conjugation, right? These pi bonds are isolated. But in the enol form, now they're conjugated, and we know that conjugation helps stabilize molecules. So these two effects added together, the um, stabilizing force of the intramolecular hydrogen bonding along with the conjugation makes the enol form more stable in this case, uh, even though normally it's the ketone and aldehyde that is the more stable. Now the tautomerization or the isomerization back and forth between the aldehyde or ketone and the enol can be catalyzed by either an acid or a base, and we need to know these mechanisms. But you've actually seen these mechanisms before. Back when we did the um, hydration and hydroboration uh, oxidation of alkynes, I asked you to learn this mechanism. Uh, and so you've definitely seen this before if you had me for uh, Orgo 1. Now the two steps in the acid catalyzed and base catalyzed atomization are the same two steps, they just happen in different orders. In the first step of the acid catalyzed atomization, the ketone is protonated. So the lone pair on the ketone attacks the hydrogen from the H3O plus. This gives us an intermediate, and this intermediate is resonance stabilized. So I have a pi bond between carbon and a more electronegative atom, so I can move uh, 
the pi bond up to become a lone pair on the oxygen, giving us a carbocation. And then is this a resonance structure that gives rise to the enol, because the last step is another proton transfer where we're deprotonating the enol to give us, uh, I'm sorry, we're deprotonating this intermediate to give us the neutral enol. All right, when we look at the base catalyzed atomization, in the last step, if you remember, the first thing we did was protonate the ketone, and then we deprotonated the uh, carbon here. In base conditions, we do the same two steps, but we do them in the opposite order. So now we're first going to deprotonate the carbon to give us this anion. This is also resonance stabilized, and so I have an allylic lone pair. So the lone pair can go down to form a pi bond. The pi bond on the oxygen becomes um, a lone pair on the oxygen. And then the second step of the base catalyzed atomization is the protonation of uh, now the oxygen. And so in acid catalyzed atomization, we first protonate the oxygen, then deprotonate the carbon. In the base catalyzed atomization, first we deprotonate the carbon, then in the second step we protonate the oxygen. Now it is fairly safe to assume that any time you have an aldehyde or a ketone in solution, at least some tiny amount is going to exist in the enol form. So it only takes an extremely small amount of acid or base to catalyze this atomization. And so even if you thoroughly clean your glassware, any tiny amounts of acid or base that have adhered to that glassware or that exists in the solution is going to be enough to catalyze this atomization. And so we almost always have enol present. And the reason that's uh, important is because it's generally the enol form that is more reactive. Uh, and specifically, in the enol form, the carbon, the alpha carbon, is nucleophilic. And we can see that based on these resonance structures. So we have an allylic lone pair, so I can move the pi bond down, then the pi bond becomes a lone pair on that carbon, and this nucleophilic carbon now can participate in nucleophilic attack. Okay, so we've talked about the enol. That's the neutral alcohol and uh, double bond adjacent to it. The enolate is what happens when I deprotonate the aldehyde or ketone or enol, whichever one uh, we have. When I deprotonate either one of those, we get the enolate. Right, so it doesn't matter whether we deprotonate the aldehyde or the ketone or we deprotonate the alcohol. We'll get the same compound, right, just with two different resonance structures. And this will happen in the presence of a lot of strong base, right? So not a catalytic amount. When I say catalytic amount, I mean a small amount of acid or base. When I have a lot of a strong base, we can produce and isolate this enolate. And the reason we might want to do that, because the enolate is much more nucleophilic than the enol. In the enol, we could draw that resonance structure where we had the lone pair and the negative charge on the carbon, but we had a positive charge on the hydrogen. In the case of the enolate, all I have is a full negative charge on this compound. And so it is much more nucleophilic and therefore reactive than the enol. All right, so most of the reactions we're going to consider in this chapter involve the enol or the enolate. The reason being because most of these reactions involve the nucleophilic attack f by the alpha carbon. And it's when the molecule is in the enol form, or particularly when it's in the enolate form, that the alpha carbon is in its most nucleophilic form. And so most of these reactions will proceed by the enol or the enolate. And because the enolate is more reactive than the enol, uh, most of the reactions will also proceed via the enolate as opposed to the enol. Now when we look at the resonance structures for the enolate, right, this is the, the negative charge, the deprotonated compound, that when, when we have these two resonance structures, the negative charge can either reside on the oxygen or the negative charge can reside on the carbon. So both the oxygen and the carbon are uh, nucleophilic, and so we can have what's called oxygen attack or carbon attack. Now, it turns out all of the reactions that we're going to study involve the carbon attack. So we're not going to worry uh, about the oxygen attack.
Now, there are two ways to consider uh, what's happening when the inlet undergoes carbon attack. This is probably the more accurate picture of what's going on. Because when we consider this resonance structure versus this one, this is probably the more favorable resonance structure because the negative charge is on the more electronegative oxygen atom rather than being on the less electronegative carbon atom. And so this is the form, or this is probably the best representation of what the enolate looks like. And so when we have the nucleophilic attack from the alpha carbon, it's probably a concerted process where the pi bond is doing the attacking and then we form the carbonyl um, at the same time. That being said, you know, this involves two arrows. If I imagine starting with the resonance structure where we already have the pi bond between the carbon and the oxygen and the, the lone pair and the negative charge is already on the alpha carbon, I can draw this same step with just a single arrow. And so a lot of the times the book will draw the enolate in this form just to simplify the drawing of the mechanisms, even though this is probably the more accurate picture. All right, so we, I mentioned this on the last slide, but uh, all of the reactions in this chapter are going to involve carbon attack, and most of the reactions in this chapter will involve enolates. Now, this chapter is devoted to alpha carbon chemistry because it's the alpha protons that are acidic. When I pop off one of these protons and put the lone pair here, that lone pair is going to be resonance stabilized because of its relation to the pi bond in the oxygen. This will give me an allylic lone pair. We're not interested in the chemistry of the beta and the gamma hydrogens because they're too far away from the pi bond in the carbonyl group, and so they're not going to be resonant stabilized. And so that's why uh, we're so interested in the alpha carbon chemistry. All right, so let's finish with an example. We want to draw both forms of the enolate when this compound is treated with a strong base. So to form the enolate with a strong base, I need to deprotonate one of the alpha carbons. And so the first thing I need to do is identify my alpha carbons. So they're going to be here and here. But in order to deprotonate it, they must have protons. So this alpha carbon doesn't have any protons. So my only choice to make the enolate would be to deprotonate this carbon. So the first form of the enolate Would look like that. And then the other resonance structure would look like that.